this past Wednesday evening at men's group, we got into a conversation really about money and about the pursuit of wealth versus the pursuit of God. And this conversation was, of course, shaped by the readings of the course of the past week. And so we talked about this tension that exists. I mean, here we live in this world where we need money to live, to pay our bills, to pay our mortgage or our rent, and buy food and clothing and all those necessities. We need this, right? And yet we're told by Jesus that we need to pursue God and righteousness above all everything else. And if we pursue God's kingdom first, Jesus tells us this, that everything else will be taken care of. And so there's a tension that exists here. It's like, well, we need money to exist in this world, and we have to, like, do jobs. And Jesus doesn't tell us just to lay about and, like, say prayers, and he'll just put some money in our bank accounts. He doesn't say that, but yet we need to pursue God first. And so we had some conversation about, we had some conversation about greed, we had some conversation about jealousy, we had some conversation about how judgmental we can get over other people and their spending habits. Wow, what a mess. And in the midst of that conversation, at one point, one of the gentlemen brought up a comment, made a, a humorous comment that kind of broke the tension. I always appreciate that. In fact, I try to do that myself. Have you noticed that? He said, well, listen, if I ever win the Powerball, I'm going to take care of the church. And we laughed and we smiled and we thought that's a wonderful thing. Now, it just so happens, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but it just so happens that the gentleman who said that is a faithful financial supporter of Hope Community Church. But when he made that comment, he reminded me of someone from my previous church. I was there for four and a half years, and there was a gentleman who was a member there, was a long-term member there, and he was active in serving in the church. He was active in volunteering in the church, but he made it very clear that he was not a financial supporter of the church. He just said, I can do this, but I can't do that. I can serve, but I can't give any money. But he would often say to me, hey, Pastor Josh, just so you know, if I ever hit it big, I'm going to take care of the church. Okay, that's great. What do you say to something like that? I'm not sure how to respond, right? At least a dozen times while I was there, he made that comment to me. Just so you know, I don't give. But if I ever win the lottery, if I ever hit it big, I'll give to the church then. Okay. Really, what do you say? Thanks in advance for something that's definitely not going to happen. What do you say to that? I don't know. So I just kind of smile and nod. And I wasn't quite bold enough to ask him the question that I was wondering internally. And the question that I wrestled with internally is, if you're a member here, if you believe in the work that we're doing here, if you have a desire to give, then what's stopping you from giving now? Now, you haven't won the lottery and you haven't hit the Powerball, but you do have income and you have a, a nice house and you have a nice car and you have a desire to give or you've expressed a desire to give so I just I can't help but wonder what's stopping you from giving something now I mean you don't have a billion bucks right but you've got something so what's stopping you from giving a percentage of that now you see there's this mentality that all of us can can uh, fall into this way of thinking, whether you're a member of this church or not, whether you're a Christian or not, sometimes we hear about these causes that resonate with us, that we believe in, these causes that we deem worthy of our financial support. And we say to ourselves, wow, if I had more money, then I would give some to this cause. But since I only have some money, I will give none to this cause. Do you know the type of thing I'm talking about? If I had more, well, then I'd give some. But since I have a little, I will give none, right? Do you like my little act that I'm doing here? I worked on this. I practiced this at home, right? But it's this mentality that we can adopt. You know, for example, I mentioned Start With One Kenya, this wonderful organization, right? From the, from the ground up, we saw this. It started with one guy realizing, hey, there's a problem we can solve in Kenya. We can give people access to clean drinking water. And this has been around, and we can see the progress that has been made. And maybe you've learned about this this organization, you say to yourself, wow, if I had a million dollars, which is a song, by the way, isn't it? But if I had a million dollars, I would give at least 100000 to start with one Kenya. But since I don't have a million dollars, I will give nothing. Right? Or how about our friend, Pastor John Clifford, right down in Chester, and the work that he's doing, Greenhouse Project. I mean, with rehabilitation and recovery and home church, and talk about a grassroots thing that's happening there, and the work that he's doing. I mean, listen, he just puts all other pastors to shame. He is in it. He is doing it. And maybe you hear about the work that he's doing, and you think, man, if I had a billion dollars, I'd give him 100 million, right? 
Is that 10%? Did I do that math right? I don't know. I don't know. But since I don't have a billion, well, maybe you do have, does anybody have a billion dollars here in this room? Stand up if you have a billion dollars. Can we do that? Do we have any undercover billionaires here? No, we never make you do that. Maybe we do. You never know. But since I don't have a billion dollars, I'll give nothing, right? It's weird, this thing that we do. We say, we see these causes, we believe in something, and we say, yes, this would be worthy of my money if I had more to give. But since I have so little, I will give nothing. The question is, well, if you believe in something, if you believe that it's worthy of your financial support, what's stopping you from giving something? Maybe not a lot, but some portion, some percentage. What's stopping you now? As a church, we believe in something called tithing, which is giving 10% of your income back to God. And when I say we believe in tithing, let me clarify what that means. We believe in the discipline of tithing. We believe in the benefits of tithing. We believe that there is a blessing associated with tithing, but we, those of us who are Christians, those of, they, those of us who are modern-day followers of Jesus Christ, we are not obligated to tithe. And so let me make that point absolutely clear. Tithing, this discipline of giving 10% of your wealth, 10% of your income back to God, tithing is absolutely optional. And I say that because over the past 2,000 years of church history, people like me, preachers, have kind of played fast and loose with the tithe thing. And some preachers and some church leaders have kind of implied that you have to tithe, right? Well, if you're going to be a real Christian, you have to do that. And some preachers have gone so far as to say, no, you have to do it. The scripture says it. Well, I'm not here to tell you that's not the case. Tithing is optional. Now, it wasn't always optional. You go back to the time of God and the nation of Israel. There was a time where God commanded the nation of Israel that they must do this. Once upon a time, God and Israel, they had this relationship, and Israel was a true theocracy, and God gave them all their laws, and one of their laws was you must present 10% of your income, whatever your income was, whatever line of work you're in, you must present that back to God. It was not optional for them, but it is optional for us. There's a specific passage of scripture that uh, people like me, preachers, refer to whenever we talk about the tithe. In fact, it's usually the only time we talk about the book of Malachi, but in the book of Malachi chapter 3, you know, we're in this situation where the Israelites were, um, they were playing fast and loose with following the command to tithe because they figured, well, who's really going to know? This is basically on the honor system. And so I know God has commanded us to give 10%, but who's looking at the books here, right? It's kind of like those people, and I know none of you do this. It's like those people who um, kind of like fudge the numbers on your taxes. We would never do that, right? But it's like, ah, oh, yeah, God doesn't, you know, the IRS doesn't need to know about this income or that income. And that's how they thought about God. Well, God doesn't need to know about all the money I make. We're going to call this, let's call this 10%. It's actually only two. Let's call it 10. Who's going to know? Well, you know who's going to know. God, right? <laughs> God's even better than the IRS. God, you, can't, you, you might be able to cheat the IRS. You can't cheat God. And so God tells the nation of Israel, hey, you're robbing me. You're pretending to give me 10% and you're not. And in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, God says to them, bring the whole tithe. Don't, don't pretend 2% is 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing until it overflows. And so to make this simple, and we could talk a lot about this whole tithing and this practice, but to make it simple, here's, here's where we are now as Christians. The command that we must do this, well, that's been satisfied. That Old Testament law, that Old Covenant, that's been satisfied from, by Jesus Christ. And so we no longer have to do this. The command has been satisfied, but the promise remains. And the promise is, if you trust me with this, if you're obedient in this, then I will bless you. And God says, you're welcome to put me in the test, put me to the test. If you give to me, you think you can outgive me? If you give to me, see how I open up the floodgates and bless your life. Now, another little word that I need to interject here. When God says that he'll bless us when we give to him, he does not specify a financial blessing. Please know that. There's this thing that's been around for a while, and some people call it the prosperity gospel. Have you heard that term, the prosperity gospel? 
It's again, people, uh, Christian people or pastors or televangelists, they go on TV and they say, hey, if you give this money to God, you're going to get rich. God doesn't say that. Let's keep in mind that Jesus was homeless and he traveled around with 12 other, other homeless guys. They were reliant on the charity and the generosity of others. And so blessing does not always mean financial blessing. And if you look at the tithe and you look at the history of the tithe, you can see that God has set this up from the very beginning, from the book of Genesis, set up this idea that we should trust him. He invites us to trust him with giving him the first fruits. That's another term. Have you heard that? First fruits, the first portion of what we have. To say, listen, God, you've given me 100%. I'm going to give you back a portion, that first portion to you. And so what we're going to do this morning is I'd like to take a look at two passages that you read recently in the Jesus series. But before we do that, I want to go all the way back to the book of Genesis because there is an encounter, there's a conversation that takes place in the book of Genesis, a conversation between God and Cain that in some very strange ways parallels a conversation that we see between Jesus and one of his disciples. So let's go all the way back to the book of Genesis, all the way back to the time of Genesis. Adam and Eve have been kicked out of paradise, kicked out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin. Adam and Eve have children, two sons named Cain and Abel. And apparently, we learn this from context, that God must have commanded them to bring sacrifices unto the Lord. Abel, he worked with livestock. He worked with cattle. He raised the cattle. Cain took care of the growing the crops and the harvest. That was his job. They both had these jobs. And you needed both of these jobs to exist. You needed the livestock and you needed the harvest, right? And so God must have commanded them to bring a sacrifice before him. Sacrifice is the key word here. Because when they brought their sacrifices to the Lord, it's not like God used these sacrifices to feed other people or to bless other people. No, they brought sacrifices to an altar and burned them up. This was strictly about obedience and trust. That's all it was about, obedience and trust. I've told you to do this. Will you obey? Will you trust me? If you give me the first, if you give me your best, do you trust that I'll take care of the rest? Give me your best, I'll take care of the rest. That's a rhyme. I just made it up. How about that, right? Give me the best, I'll take care of the rest. And so we read in the book of Genesis when the sacrifices were due, Cain and Abel bring their sacrifices, right? And so Abel... Abel, who worked with the cattle, he brought what's described as fat portions, one of my favorite terms in all the Bible. He brought fat portions to the Lord, put them on an altar, burned them up. Now, Cain, we're not given insight into his mentality, but Cain does not bring the fat portions, right? Cain brings some. He brings some, right? And so he takes from his crops and he presents some to the Lord to be burned up. What was his mentality? I don't know. Listen, I'm a fairly logical person. And if I worked really hard, you know, raising cattle or like growing crops, which I've never done either, by the way. But if I worked really hard growing crops and then God said, hey, I want you to put some there and then burn them up. I mean, doesn't that feel wasteful? Is it just me? I mean, can we be honest in this space? I know it's a church and all. Can we be honest here? Doesn't that feel wasteful? I'm just going to burn it. I worked so hard, I'm just going to burn it? And so maybe, just maybe, that was his mentality when he brings some to the Lord. Abel brings the fat portions, Cain brings some. And God shows favoritism. Isn't that, isn't that wrong? No, he does. He shows favoritism to Abel. Out of boy, Abel. You've been obedient. You've trusted me. Well done. Hey, Cain. Right? And so that's what, that's what God does. And how do you think Cain feels about that? Pretty ugly feelings start to bubble up within the heart of Cain. Anger. Resentment. Jealousy. And so God, being God, knows exactly what's going on in Cain's heart. And he says to him, Cain, you better watch out. I mean, sin is crouching at your door. That's what God says. Sin is crouching at your door, and it seeks to overtake you. But Cain, if you're feeling jealous right now, if you're feeling angry, I mean, why would you feel angry towards your brother? Cain, here's all you have to do, Cain, if you want to get rid of these feelings. Next time the sacrifices are due, do like your brother did. 
like hearing that? All right, do you have a brother or a sister? Did your parent ever say that? Just act more like your brother. Act more like your sister. Did you ever get that? Oh. And so God says to Cain, just do what Abel did. Bring me the best. Bring me the fat portions. If you want to receive the same level of praise, then do the same thing that he did. And so what do you think Cain does? You think he says, Yo, you know what, God? Uh, you're God, and I'm just some guy, and you're clearly right, and you know, it's tough to be corrected by you, but you're making a good point, and I can't argue with your logic there. So, all right, God, I'll do it. Next time the sacrifices are due, I'll bring the fat portions too because I know that will make you happy. Thanks for being patient with me, God. No, that's not what he does at all. He goes out. Cain goes out, looks for his brother. He kills him. Everything you need to know about human nature is right there in the book of Genesis. That's how people are. And so we have this, this encounter with God trying to correct Cain's mentality, trying to correct God's heart. And then I want to flash forward all the way to the time of Jesus. And just a couple weeks ago in the Jesus series reading plan, you read about this occasion where Jesus had this opportunity to be with Mary, her sister Martha, and their brother Lazarus. And this is after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. And so they're sitting there together. And can you imagine this scene? I mean, just a few weeks ago, we talked about the resurrection of Lazarus. I mean, this highlight, this wonderful, bold miracle, this undeniable miracle that Jesus performs. And so it's not like he just performs this miracle and never sees him again. No, he goes back and he's with them. And it's six days before the Passover. I'm in John chapter 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him supper, and Martha, one of the siblings, was serving. And so if you're Mary, or if you're Martha, if you're one of the siblings of Lazarus, how do you feel in that moment? Jesus, thank you for what you've done. He was dead, and you've brought him back. And just like can you imagine the emotion in the room with Jesus and the disciples and Mary and Martha and there's Lazarus and just the, the joy that was experienced there? They're having supper. And then Mary, verse 3, Mary does this thing and perhaps she excuses herself from the table. And she comes back with this, this jar of perfume. Now we know that Mary... And Martha and Lazarus, they possess some means. I don't know if they were rich. They possess some means. And so she comes back with this jar of perfume. It's very expensive. In fact, it, it cost about a year's, the average year's salary to purchase this perfume. And she takes it and she uses it to wash the feet of Jesus. Now, in those days... It was not uncommon if you were to enter the home of a wealthy person. It was not uncommon for them to have a servant there present who would wash your feet, you know, with water, right? Because you'd be out all day, you'd be walking around in the sand, in sandals, your feet would be filthy. And so it's kind of like, you know, some people's houses, they have you take off your shoes. It's kind of the same thing. If you're going to come into my house, we're going to wash off your stinky feet, or your filthy feet before you come in, right? And so that was, that was not uncommon. But no one used expensive perfume. And so she opens up the lid. Pours out, you know, a year's salary, pours it out on the feet of Jesus. And then she gets down on her hands and knees. And she doesn't use a washcloth. She doesn't use a towel. She doesn't use an old robe. She takes her hair and begins washing the feet of Jesus. This is a showstopper. The, the, the awkwardness of that moment, the beauty of this moment, and the disciples are there. To witness this. I mean, this is such an act of appreciation and gratitude and humility. I mean, we're right up, we're butting up against the line of just being degrading. I mean, she's doing this though. She's choosing to wash the feet of Jesus with her hair. And the disciples take issue with this. And John specifies for us that it's Judas that takes issue with this. And Judas takes Jesus aside. You know what Judas does? Judas attempts to correct Jesus. Let's remember where we are in the timeline. This is like three years into everything. Judas has seen Jesus walk on water. He's seen Lazarus raised from the dead. He's seen the blind given their sight back. He's seen miracle after miracle after miracle. He's been there for it all. He's heard all the teachings. He's been right there for all of this. And yet Judas feels like, you know what, now it's my time to correct Jesus. 
And he says, Jesus, do you realize what you've just let happen here? Do you realize how expensive that perfume was? That was like a year's wages. She opened that up, and she just wasted all of that money on your feet? I mean, Jesus, we've been with you. How many times, Jesus, how many times have you told us to take care of the poor and take care of the needy and feed the poor? And can you think about how much we could have done with this money? Are you kidding me? And you let her just waste it on your feet. We could have used that money to feed the poor. Now, I wasn't there. And Grayson, I'm sorry for yelling. I wasn't there. So I don't know how heated it got in that moment. I don't know. But then Jesus corrects Judas. He says, Judas, you don't realize what's happening here. Judas, this woman has done a beautiful thing for me. Judas, what she has done for me will not be taken away from her. Judas, she's preparing my body for death. By the end of this week, I'm going to be on a cross dying. She's prepared my body for death, and you cannot take that away from her. And Judas, if you care so much about the poor, what's stopping you from helping them now? I'm not stopping you. You care about feeding the poor? Go out and feed the poor. Again, I wasn't there. But does Judas receive those words of correction from the Son of God? Does Judas receive those words of correction from Jesus? You know what, Jesus, that's a good point. I wasn't thinking in those terms. I'm sorry. No, that's not what happens. That's not what happens at all. It is this moment where Judas decides, I'm going to kill Jesus. Now, Judas does not literally put Jesus on the cross, but Judas decides in that moment, I know Jesus has enemies, and I know where Jesus is. I know where he's going to be, and so I'm going to meet with the Sanhedrin. I'm going to meet with the enemies of Jesus, and I'm going to turn him in because this is a bridge too far. This is the straw that breaks the camel's back. I've been with you for a long time, Jesus, but how dare you? How dare you allow your salary to be wasted on your feet? Judas, that's his moment where he decides he will betray Jesus. Man, oh man. Money. Greed. Wealth. Jealousy. Human nature. What an absolute mess we find ourselves in. Friends, don't underestimate greed and how dangerous it is and how easy it can fall into. You know, John specifies for us that the heart of Judas, he really didn't care about the poor. He was the treasurer for the disciples. He used to help himself to that money. His heart, his heart didn't care about the poor. He cared about taking care of himself. Where is your heart today? What are you focused on? What's your desire? So we contrast this occasion with Judas, and then we look, we look at the scripture reading for today. And during that week, This is leading up to the crucifixion and then resurrection of Jesus. We're in the book of Luke. In fact, this is in your bulletin. We can read right from your bulletin here if you want to take a look at that passage in Luke 21. And Jesus is there in the synagogue. And a synagogue, if you're not familiar, a synagogue is is very similar in many ways to a local church. Back then, the Israelites, they had their temple. We don't have an equivalent for a temple. The temple is where the sacrifices were performed. We no longer need to perform sacrifices because Jesus has satisfied that law. But the synagogue was a local place where people would come together as a congregation to hear the word of the Lord and to celebrate the Lord and to worship the Lord. And just like modern day churches, an offering was collected. There was a treasury box very similar to what we have. And Jesus is there in Luke 21, verse 1, and he looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. You know, people that had means, people who were wealthy, and they came up and they presented their gift to the Lord. And according to Luke's gospel, I mean, there's some details that, that Luke doesn't specify here. We don't know if they walked up with their big fat checks so everybody could see, hey, look at this. Da, 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 boom. We don't know if that was their heart, if that was their attitude according to Luke's gospel. But we do know that the rich are putting their gifts in. And then Jesus sees a poor widow putting in two small copper coins, right? What does the King James say? The widow's might. Putting in two small coins copper coins that put together they were worth one cent one cent and he sees the widow putting in that offering now let me ask you a question what is that synagogue going to do with this widow's one cent 
what's that going to do? How far is that one cent going to go? You're going to be able to pay the synagogue staff with that one cent, right? You're going to be able to make repairs to your building with that one cent. What are you going to do with one cent? You know what, lady? Just keep your one cent. Keep your two coins. What are you doing? I mean, back in those days, widows, I mean, so often Jesus talks about taking care of widows and orphans because they had no one else to take care of them. It's not like this widow was collecting her husband's Social Security checks. It's not like she had a retirement. No, she was on her own. And all she had left, 100% of her wealth added up to one cent. And she took that everything. She took that 100% of what she had, and she put it in the treasury. Wouldn't you try to talk her out of it? But listen, lady, you need to keep this. This synagogue doesn't need it. You need to keep this. But what does Jesus say? He looks at her gift. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all gave out of their surplus, and they put it into the offering. Surplus is the key word there. You know what surplus means? Surplus doesn't mean first fruits. Surplus doesn't mean fat portions. Surplus means, okay, I've paid my bills, I've spent money on what I want to spend money on, I've invested in my retirement, and look, I have a surplus left over. I'll put some of the surplus in the treasury. That's what surplus means. So they gave out of their surplus. This woman put in everything, 100%. She put, not only did she put 100% of her money into the offering, she put 100% of her trust in God to provide. And Jesus knows that. And he says, that's it. That gift is more valuable than what anybody else put into that box. Now, if I were to ask the widow that question, hey, what's stopping you from giving to the Lord? She could have answered me, right? Well, what's stopping me is I only have two pennies left. I can't even split this up into 10%. That's what would be stopping her. But instead... She busts right through that reason, busts right through that excuse and says, I'm going to give everything I have to give to God. Friends, Jesus doesn't require 10%. <laughs> you know what his percentage is that he requires? He requires 100% of our trust. That's what's necessary. And when we look at the gospel, when we look at the story of salvation, how we receive salvation, we are saved by putting 100%, not 10, 100% of our trust in Jesus for our salvation. There's no amount of good works you can do, no amount of money you can give. You have to put 100% of your trust in Jesus and what he has done for us. Friends, watch out. There are a couple things that can keep us away from truly giving ourselves over to following Jesus. And the big one is money. I want to hold on to my money. I'll trust Jesus with other areas of my life. I'll trust him with my work life. I'll trust him with my family life. I might even trust him with my romantic life. But my financial life? No, 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 no. Statistically speaking, that's the last thing that we surrender over to God, our finances. I told you a story earlier about that guy in my old church that used to talk about winning the lottery and, and giving money over. Well, at that same church, there was a couple there. And that couple was there for a long time. They were very active in serving. They were very active in leading. And just like the other gentleman I told you about, uh, they did not give financially to the church. But it was another one of those situations where they told me, if we ever get some money, if we ever get a promotion, if we ever get a new job, if we ever get an inheritance, we will give to the church, Pastor Josh. We will give. But here's the funny thing about this couple. They actually got some money. <laughs> How about that? They came into some money, and I don't know the exact number, but it had to be tens of thousands. It was probably upwards of 100,000. They got some money. So how about that? And what do you think they did? Any guesses? I'll tell you what they did. They bought a vacation home, and they left the church. They severed all those relationships, bought a vacation home, and they left. The These were good Christian people, good Christian people. But they had to leave because they made these proclamations. If we had more, well, then we'd give some. If we had more, well, then we'd give some. But we don't have more, so we'll give none. But if we ever have more, we'll give some. Friends, <laughs> don't fool yourselves. Greed is ugly, and it's crouching at your door. It's crouching at my door, and it seeks to devour us and take us over. Watch out. And I wonder all these years later, I wonder about that couple. I wonder, was it worth it? 
to sever all those relationships in your community just to have that vacation property? Was it worth it? So let me talk to all of you this morning. First off, I want to talk to the people in this congregation who tithe, okay? So I want to say a few things to you. The first thing I want to say to you is thank you, and I can't say that enough. Thank you to our tithers. Thank you for your trust. Thank you for your belief in what we're doing here as a church, because if you didn't believe in what we were doing, you wouldn't be a tither. So thank you so much. Thank you for keeping the lights on. And I want to give you a personal thank you, tithers. Thank you because I am one of the expenses of the church. Did you realize that? I'm on staff here. So on behalf of my family, thank you, tithers. But tithers, I also need to issue a word of warning to you. Don't hide behind the tithe. That almost rhymes. Don't hide behind the tithe. Because here's what can happen. And this is a warning, especially for those of you who are new to this discipline of tithing. Here's what can happen. You say, okay, well, I'm giving that 10%. And then another need comes along, a need that you're able to meet. But you think, you know what? I'm not going to give to this because I'm already tithing. Just remember. Jesus doesn't demand a tithe. He demands 100%. Or some people, they tithe and they think, well, this is what I'm going to do for the church. I'm not going to serve. I'm not going to volunteer. I'm not going to spend my time. I'm not going to give it my time, but I'll give some money. I'm going to tithe, and that's it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. Don't hide behind that. We still need to serve. Still need to volunteer. Still need to support hands-on ways. So don't hide behind the tithe. And so thank you, tithers, but I just have to issue that word of warning to you. And to those of you who are members of this church and who are not tithers, my question to you is, if you, and this is very specific, if you are somebody who believes in what we're doing as a church, what's stopping you from giving now? What's stopping you from giving some now? If you have that mentality, well, I do believe in it. If I had more, I'd give some, but I don't have any, so I'm not going to give any. Well, hang on. What's stopping you from giving now? And if 10% feels like, I don't know if I could take that step, okay, how about five? Trust God with five and see how that works. How about you trust God with two and see, take a step forward in trusting God. And let me say this loud and clear so everyone understands, if the only thing that's holding you back from giving to God, if the only thing that's stopping you is you're not quite sure about this church, right? You feel like, you know, I trust God and I want to give him 10%, but I'm not sure about Hope Community Church. Well, there's a solution to that. One solution is you get to know us better, and once you're comfortable, then you give. The other solution is find another church. Find another other way to give. You know, whenever a preacher stands up and talks about money, it's never an easy task, but I do have a, something on our side here. We're doing quite well financially as a church, right? So I get to give this message. It's a lot easier to give this message. I mean, if we were in a major deficit, this would be a tough message to give, but it's not. This isn't about us as a church. This is about you trusting God and being obedient to God and trusting him, not with 10% of your life, not 10% of your trust, but 100% of your trust to God. God tells us, put me to the test in this. If you trust me with the 10, if you trust me with the, the fat portions, if you trust me with that first fruits, I will take care of you. I will bless you. I will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour those blessings into your life. God invites us, and this is the only time he does this, he invites us to put him to the test. When we, as individuals, when we trust God with all of our everything, including our finances, when we trust God, he blesses us. And when we continue to trust him, he will to continue to bless us as individuals. And as we continue to trust him, he will continue to bless us, our families, as we continue to put our trust in him to provide, not just for some of our needs, but all of our needs. When we continue to trust him, he will continue to bless this, his church.